Hello everyone and welcome to Fertile Ground with Mike and Coach. My name is Mike Cornell and I'm alongside Coach Ron Lathy. Jesus' followers did not recognize him immediately following the resurrection. How is that possible? And why do many people not recognize Jesus today? These are some interesting discussion points that we're going to take a really serious look at as we get started. And as we get started, we have three things we would like for you to think about and to consider. And the first one is this. Like the men, why do we sometimes not recognize the presence of Jesus? And this is a really good spot for your note taker to grab a pen, grab a piece of paper, grab your Bible, and follow right along with us here today. Second of all, how should we respond to someone who says the Old Testament is not valuable? And then finally, how can a fellowship meal be an opportunity to share the gospel? And that'll be an interesting discussion on that last question, Coach. And we, we continue with the International Sunday School series this week. And Coach, here we go. Last week, the title of our discussion was The Empty Tomb. And we began the study in the book of Luke. This week, we continue in the book of Luke. And the title of our uh, study this week is Disciples Believe the Resurrection. And we're going to be in Luke chapter 24, looking at verses 13 through 27 and verses 30 and 31. And Coach, could you get us started with some prayer and just kind of set the stage for us as we get started today? Sure. Let us pray. Our most kind and loving Heavenly Father, Lord, we just come humbly before you today, just first of all, thanking you for the blessings that you give us each day, thanking you for life and and Lord, the, the uh, opportunity to come and share your word uh, as we are in, our, in the midst of our uh, Easter season, Lord, we, uh, it just brings our mind to the resurrection and, and the miracle that, that was performed there and the sacrifice that was given by your son and who paved the way for anyone who would just believe in him to, ha to have eternal life with you. And Lord, there's no greater gift that we could ever receive. Lord, as we uh, open your word today, we just ask that you open our hearts and uh, uh, just speak through the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we might be giving out the information that, that you want the people to hear. And we pray, Lord, there will be somebody there listening that is receptive to that uh, and make the, this maybe a, a monumental decision day for them as ex to accept your son as the sacrifice for them and their eternal ticket into heaven. Uh, Lord, just, oh, just again, open our uh, eyes and our hearts and our mouths and, and give us the words you want us to speak today and guide us with your spirit. This we ask your son's precious and holy name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> yeah, Mike, uh, we are looking at kind of the next step after our lesson from last week. Right. Uh, and uh, we know that the uh, the women had gone to the tomb and found the tomb empty and and found the two the angels there that told them or, or basically asked them in the in the form of a question but it was really kind of a rebuke yeah. you know <laughs> what are you doing here looking for people alive people that you know here uh, you know that because Jesus has risen uh, why why do you why do you look here for those that are dead when they're alive. And that you know, of course, we talked about a few of the names of the women that were there, and and uh, they went away from the from the uh, from the grave, you know, very excited and very joyful. And and we are going to look at uh, maybe a, a couple today that were also there. I think if we they appear to have been there, but they went. They didn't have the joy that the, that the women did because. Uh, I, I don't think they could believe what what they were hearing from from the witnesses. I don't. I, I have a feeling they didn't actually go look in the tomb, but uh, it was just more than they could believe at that time. So we, we know that uh, Peter and John had run to the tomb and and saw the grave clothes where it looked like Jesus was almost still in them, but that uh, it was as if he had just kind of floated out of them and they settled back down on the. Uh, the tomb bed, and so uh, you know, a very interesting time for the, for the disciples. They were still very skeptical. They didn't believe the women at first, 
And um, so they had a, a, what we call a crisis of faith then too. Uh, you know, do they believe that? And, and do they really believe he's risen or not? And we see that they all came up a little bit short in the faith department uh, after all that. So uh, we, we know that, that as we look back on the resurrection, as we said last week, the most pivotal point in history, human history, was the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Right. There's no greater day uh, that, that had, had come to that point. And we know that uh, uh, to help with these uh, unbelievers or maybe to strengthen their faith, we're going to find that Jesus actually came and appeared to some of them. And, and then, then they believed. Uh, but as we're going to find today, sometimes when he appeared to them, they didn't recognize him. Yep. And uh, so you might think, well, well how, how could that happen? And we'll talk about that as we go along. But, but Jesus did re appear several times to his followers and, and even to the women before the, uh, we know that he appeared first to Mary Magdalene uh, while she was there in the garden. And uh, so he did make a, make a physical appearance to them and for various reasons, as we, as we shall see. But we're going to pick up with two, two people that are basically going home with their heads hanging low. Yep. <laughs> uh, and uh, they, they are feeling a little sorry for themselves. They feel like that they, uh, you know, a lot of their hope is gone. And uh, so it's interesting how Jesus appears to, to these two. Um, and this is a, a famous, uh, you know, story in the in the Bible, and and uh, there's even uh, people who make what they call even today uh, the walk to Emmaus, yeah. uh, and and uh, we're going to look at these two who made the first walk uh, to Emmaus. Well, and as we get started here, we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 24. And like you just described, the narrative has these two individuals on that walk right. to Emmaus beginning here. And it says, two men walk with Jesus and don't know it. Right. And this is going to be a real interesting piece of this story uh -huh. here as we get started. And we're going to start with uh, Luke chapter 24. We're going to look at verses 13 and 14 as we get started. And God's word says this. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. So the, the traveler's coach began their journey on the same day that the women had been to the tomb, which we know is the first day of the week. Right, which is, uh, was that Sunday in the Resurrection Day. Right. Uh, yeah, that's, so they, they uh, had been, and they were coming, I believe, from the tomb with the people that, there, but maybe were kind of held back and, and didn't, like I said, really go in to see the tomb and, and just kind of heard some of the rumors that, that were flying around about angels and about empty tomb and the grave clothes and so forth. So they had, did not really believe that uh, uh, Jesus had, had risen, I don't believe. Uh, and we know it says that they were going back to Emmaus and uh, a distance of about seven miles uh, the King James Version says that it was three score furlongs, and three score means three times 20 or 60, and furlongs, and a furlong was right around 650 feet, they say, in biblical uh, measurements. So they came up with that's about seven miles from uh, where they were. Uh, and they began their journey, and as they said, on the same day that, that Jesus had risen, and we know that the women, when they visited the tomb and came back with all these things they were telling everybody, it created quite a stir, uh, you know, because we know uh, that, uh, as we talked about last week, the tomb had been sealed uh, so that uh, any of, as far as the leaders and Pilate and all of them were concerned, there's no way that Jesus is going to get out of the tomb. Right. And nobody's going to get in to take his body to try to pretend that he's out of the tomb. So... Um, yeah, you know, as we know, this uh, ended up being just a catastrophe for the guards and for the leaders because they have no idea what's happened to the body. You know, obviously they don't believe he's risen, right. but uh, they, they've got to come up with some kind of a uh, an explanation. 
And one of the things they tried to do was they called the guards and tried to bribe them to say that the disciples stole the body. <laughs> and, you know, all kinds of things came from this. But, you know, the, the uh, uh, two guys that we're talking about here today, they're going home. They've had enough that, you know, they uh, think that everything that they were hoping for through Jesus was now gone. And uh, so they're on their way back to Emmaus and says that they were uh, talking to each other about everything that had happened. And you can only imagine the things that are going back and forth in that conversation that, um, you know, trying to think, well, you know, maybe this happened or do you think he's really alive? And, you know, just conversations that we would, that they would, uh, again, uh, talk about going down the road. And, and some, in, I'm sure, included uh, you know, we were counting on him being the Messiah. Right. We were counting on him being coming and setting up, setting up Israel in in uh, freedom from Rome, because they were expecting him him to come as a king, and uh, so that I'm sure was one of the con parts of the conversation. So they're they're very sad and gloomy and and fearful and they're scared. Uh, they're confused. They don't know what to think right now. But they they were desperate, and and what they needed was was a pep talk from Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're going to get it. But you, you have to remember, there, there's a reason they're downcast, and, and they're they're on this this road to Emmaus, and, and they're probably walking quite slow oh, with yeah. their heads down. You have to remember what they probably these things they either saw or heard directly about mm -hmm. Jesus' arrest. His trial, his crucifixion, and his burial, right. and that seemed, in, at least from their perspective, to destroy this hope right. that that they had had. Right. It's real interesting here, too, Coach. We see God establishing uh, two witnesses because mm -hmm. these two men are going to witness the risen Christ here in just a second, mm -hmm. and and really, once again, uh, God follows the laws of Moses, mm -hmm. so to speak. Uh, which the laws of Moses use two witnesses to verify right. something. Right. And once again, uh, God is doing that yeah. with, with these mm -hmm. two men. They don't know it yet, yeah. but we right. know the end of the story. Right. But all throughout history, all throughout the Bible, there are various places that are really, really important points where God made sure there were two witnesses there right. just to fulfill the laws of Moses, so exactly. to speak. Exactly. Uh, but they were talking about the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Christ on their way back. and Not the resurrection part, mm -hmm. but the death and the burial and everything up to that. And really, us as Christians, Coach, should do that as well. Mm -hmm. that, that's a good way that we should encourage each other, that that story should inspire us. I mean, that is our Lord and Savior. So we mm -hmm. should remind each other of that quite often. Yeah, and, and it's, there's no greater... <laughs> hope that comes out of that story now that we can look back and realize what happened it should be really exciting for us to talk about yeah real exciting all right let's go on to verse 15 and 16 as they talked and discussed these things with each other jesus himself came up and walked along with them but they were kept from recognizing him and we find that a little bit humorous to start yeah. off with but at some point as they, they walked, Jesus joined them, and he continued to walk with them. Yeah, the, you know, and this, this, is, this is Jesus. The risen Jesus has, comes in and uh, just settles in and starts walking with them. Doesn't, you know, doesn't say, hi, how you doing, or anything. He just <laughs> kind of slips in there and listens to them for a little bit. And uh, it, it, he says the Lord himself is the one that, you know, that's there. So there's no question right. uh, about who this is. And uh, the, uh, the idea of Jesus being near them is something that they have never even imagined, I'm sure, as they're, as they're walking. And, you know, of course, obviously the question we run into is why don't they recognize him? <coughs> Excuse me, and there's a number of reasons that could be, could be and, but some that we might think of is, um, you know, the last time they saw him probably, 
he was hanging on a cross. Yep, and unrecognizable. And, and unrecognizable. He had been beaten. His face was probably swollen, and uh, you know, to where he was almost unre. You know, we hear about people being beaten till they're unrecognizable, and I'm sure he would have qualified for that. So he is now, uh, you know, after a, you know rising from the dead. I'm sure that he has uh, has been given a change in his resurrected body, uh, and he will look different than he did, what did hanging on the cross. Uh, so that could be part of it. And then, as, as we have we know from, uh, for example, Mark sixteen twelve tells us, and after that he appeared in a different form to them. And again, that's a bodily change. Uh, you know, sometimes we call it the glorified body after death that, that even Christians will receive after, after they die. And the, so maybe he was in his glorified body and, uh, and like I said, had a different appearance. You know, e- even when he appeared to the disciples in his glorified body, they weren't sure, you know, who it was at first. To, till they got close enough to recognize him. And so that might be a reason and possibly, um, you know, that uh, more so than anything else may have been, as we're going to find out, he had some teaching to do. And if they had recognized him immediately, they would have been, you know, he would have lost their attention, say, right. so to speak. Yep. They would have been so happy and everything. So he's trying to teach them something here. And I think probably more than anything else, he, you know, God just simply made it so that the, he was not recognizable. And of course, their, you know, their attitude, they were, like I said, probably had their head down, sulking along. And so with all those things, they just flat didn't recognize that it was Jesus. Well, one thing is for sure. They certainly weren't looking for Jesus. No. They weren't expecting Jesus. So Jesus would have had to get right up in their face from the, the image of him that they remembered uh, for them to you know, really embrace who, mm-hmm. who this person was. But God can both our phys- God can open both our physical and spiritual eyes and close them right. at will. Absolutely. So like you said, there's some spiritual truths that are going to come out here, and we, th- you and I, I think, agree that Jesus needs to reveal this stuff to them gradually. Mm-hmm. So they've got about a seven-mile walk here yeah. to, to gradually reveal who he is and, and some of these teachings he's wanting them mm-hmm. to learn. But one thing is for certain as well, these guys are focused on their problems. Right. They're not focused on, mm-hmm. on Jesus at all, and no. focusing on our problems makes it very difficult to focus on Jesus. And how many times do we do that in our own lives, Mm -hmm. in our own Christian walk that we have, we focus on the problems and instead of focusing on Jesus where we should be focused. Right, you know, we we forget that Jesus is the problem solver and we end up focusing on our conditions rather than uh, him. So, but he he is always around us and then, you know, He's, you know, he made the statement. He said, "Where two or more are gathered, yep. I will be in their midst." So we forget that sometimes, yep. and uh, so he is present, uh, even if we don't recognize that he's present. And that takes us to that first question, and that is, like the men, why do we sometimes not recognize the presence of Jesus? Now we we kind of poke a little bit of fun at these guys because mm-hmm. they don't recognize it, but we're not walking in their shoes. Right. But why, why, like these men, do we sometimes not recognize Jesus' presence? Well, you know, you mentioned for the biggest thing, I think, is the fact we're not looking for it. <laughs> yeah. You know, we, we, don't, we don't realize and actually say that Jesus is right here with us. You know, we, think, we don't think of that. That's not foremost in our mind, that we, we have that... Uh, ability to to be in the presence of Christ because he said he, you know he would always be with us so uh, we're not really looking for him and and of course if we need him he's usually the last one we call on uh, you know if we're in trouble or we need some help or something even some advice or some guidance uh, we, we go to our buddies and our doctors and our friends and stuff to to get that kind of advice and don't really ask Christ for, for the answers. 
And the other thing that you mentioned, we all have spiritual eyes and spiritual discernment. And God can turn that on or off at will. Yep. And this is why I think, you know, like we said here for these two guys, uh, God, Jesus had some things to teach them. And he knew that they would never get it taught and you know if they recognized him right away and so that's that's why they uh you know like the things we talked about that's why they didn't really recognize him and uh, and for the same reasons we often don't recognize him either um so uh it's 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 one of those things that that we are today anyway we're often too busy uh to really sit down and think about you know, talking to Christ as if he's right there, right. you know, and, and that's where uh, uh, some people today, you know, if, if you sit down and we're talking to Christ on the seat and they hear you, they're liable to think, you know, you're going nuts, you know, so, <laughs> but that's the way it ought to be. Right. We ought to be able to come, you know, and talk to Jesus as if he's sitting right beside us and he promised that he would be, so. Well, there, there's, there's really about three things that, that these guys are going to have but it's not going to be good enough. Mm-hmm. Number one, they had their physical senses. Mm-hmm. They ate with Jesus. They, they bedded with Jesus. They cooked with him. Uh, Jesus probably had touched them on the shoulders mm-hmm. or shook hands with them at, at certain times. But it, it's remarkable that when Jesus appeared to any of the disciples for the first time, they didn't recognize him. No. And, and they had this physical thing there, the physical senses. The other is they had the facts. Mm-hmm. They, they either... <laughs> They either saw it firsthand or were told, mm-hmm. and and yet they don't recognize Jesus when they were talking to him face to face. So facts alone don't get us there. Right. So the physical senses don't get us there. Facts alone don't get us there. And the third thing they have, and we're going to address that, at least this narrative does a little later, is the, their knowledge of the Bible right. or their Bible study. Right. It's, it by itself is insufficient to really reveal Jesus' presence to us. How would you like to have Jesus in your Bible study or in your small group? Mm -hmm. That's what these guys had every single day. I mean, it it was incredible. And that's what happens with these two men. They're going to have a Bible study with Jesus on this road to Emmaus. But even with Jesus as as their Bible teacher, Mm -hmm. they still did not recognize him. Mm -hmm. Religious and Bible knowledge alone are insufficient for what for recognizing Jesus' presence. Here's how you recognize Jesus' presence. All these things do are enhance it. Mm-hmm. But what you have to do, God has to open your eyes mm-hmm. to Jesus' presence. That's the only way you're going to be able to see Jesus. And like you said, he can open and close that at will. Yeah. And and you know, the thing you mentioned too, Mike, that's really important is, is, it, is Bible knowledge. Yeah. You know, these guys... Uh, maybe they didn't push hard enough to really listen to what Jesus was saying and didn't try to understand everything he was telling them. So when he told them about all this was going to happen, they, they, they kind of shoved it off as, ah, yeah, right. You know, you know and they couldn't envision that this was going to happen to the, cause they thought he was the Messiah yeah. and you know, they just couldn't envision this happening. So when it did happen, they just kind of looked at it back, they forgot about the spiritual aspect of it and went back to the uh, human aspect of it. And they just say, well, that, that, that can't be, you know. So. That chapter was closed for right. them from right. their perspective. Right. All right, let's go to verses 17 and 18. And it says, he asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. And verse 18 says, one of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? So Jesus' question was intended really, Coach, to start a conversation, not really to gain knowledge from these guys. No, and it's interesting that just the way, uh, you know, he, he asked him there, you know, he said, what are you talking about? Uh, you know, why are you so sad? As if he didn't know, right? right? You know, <laughs> and, and he's just starting the, opening the conversation with them and trying to get them to to tell him, you know, what they were feeling and what they had been talking about. And as we thought said, you know, they were talking about all these events in Jerusalem and and everything that surrounded the the uh, crucifixion. So uh, 
Uh, and they, one of them is mentioned here, Cleopas. And, and uh, uh, Cleopas, there's not, the, we hear about him in a couple places, but the early church historians say that, that they think Cleopas was uh, the, the brother of Joseph, Mary's husband. Uh, so, uh, that, you know, which that would kind of make him an uncle to Christ, you know, step uncle, step uncle. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, uh, that, that seems to be, uh, I don't, you can't, I haven't found it in the Bible anywhere, but tradition seems to say that. So maybe that part could be true, but in any event, uh, we know that, that Jesus question, as you said, was not meant to get information, but it was just to try to get the conversation going. So apparently these, they had given up on, as we said, everything because they were so downtrodden and, and the countenance that they were, they were promoting in their faces. And, and uh, we know that, that uh, um, it, you know, it, the, once they started talking to Jesus and, and he asked them, he said, what are you talking about? Their reaction is, where have you been? Yeah, it, you know, you you've been been around here, and you could you don't know what's happening, uh, you know. So uh, uh, we we know it's it, it would kind of kind of be like walking down the street in in our t- town here, and and be taught and talk to somebody about the uh, you know the uh, people going to the moon and back, <laughs> and uh, the stranger joins would might come up to us and say. You mean they've been to the moon? Well, you know that's the kind of reaction that, that, that they think Jesus has here. Right. It's like you know, you mean you haven't heard of that of all this stuff that's going on here. So it would be difficult for somebody today to to not know that the, we have gone to the moon and back. So that's kind of the reactions that they seem to to have here. It was just as incredible that the disciples thought this guy didn't know what was going on. So that was just a shock to them. So, uh, but the, the the ironic thing, Mike, is the fact that the the one who really knew what went on was the, was the stranger, <laughs> yeah. Jesus. So that, so he was getting their take of it. Well, when you consider the popularity of Jesus and, and really coach the hatred that the religious leaders had for him, mm-hmm. everything that happened would have been the topic of every conversation. Sure. Like you said, it, you, you could even make it like a modern day conversation about mm-hmm. men walking on the moon. Mm-hmm. Uh, no, everybody knows that. Right. It, it wouldn't be possible. Right. But the truth is, if anyone knew what, the, what happened in Jerusalem and what these guys were talking about, it was this stranger that they uh, yeah. recognized here. Uh, that was right in front of them. Yeah, well, you know, th- this was th- this was no insignificant small thing. No, this was one of those things that rocked their world, uh, as we would say today. And that takes us to verse nineteen. It says, "What things he asked about Jesus of Nazareth?" They replied, "He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people." So Jesus asked these followers of the, that he has. Mm-hmm to recount these things mm-hmm. as they understood them. Right. You know, he wanted, he wanted to hear their take on it, right. so to speak. And, uh, you know, and Jesus asked them to, to recount the, the events as they understood it. And they, they replied concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now, you know, Jesus was really a popular name at that time in that area. <laughs> and But when they put Jesus of Nazareth, now they have labeled him. They, everybody they, knows. Everybody knows who they're talking about. Uh, there were a lot of people named Jesus, but there was only one Jesus of Nazareth. So they made it very clear that this was the was the Jesus that was they thought was the Messiah. And, of course, we know it is the Messiah. And, uh, and notice how quickly, though, they... They backed off from saying things like, oh, he, was, he is the Messiah or he's the son of God. None of that came out, yep. uh, you know, which I think maybe Jesus was fishing for, trying like he did with Peter. You know, who do you say that I am? And uh, they said, no, he's, he was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. So now they've backed him down to the level of a prophet. He's a great prophet. He's a miracle worker, but, but he's not... The Messiah. They're, they've lost their their hope that he was the Messiah. Yeah. So uh, you know they they were they were very downhearted because, like you said, they were thinking more about themselves than anybody else, uh, what that meant to them. So 
Uh, did they believe that he was more than a tra- the more than just a prophet? I don't think so. Not now. They've lost their high uh, thinking of that he was so great. They thought he was the Messiah. Now they brought him down a notch. Well, and this this seems like coach. It kind of points to and reveals what their internal motivation was for their faith originally, mm-hmm. anyways, right. and that's for their selfish desires right. because. They are oppressed by Rome right now, mm-hmm. and, and they thought the Messiah was going to come riding in on a big white stallion and overthrow the Roman government so that they would have their freedom back, so mm-hmm. to speak. And undoubtedly, these two men had believed that Jesus was the Messiah, mm-hmm. but after what happened to him in Jerusalem, they, they certainly began to think something else, right. and they're proving that as they walk along. Even Jesus' closest inner circle— mm-hmm. We have read about and we'll study later. Uh, believe that same thing, right? And it kind of kind of makes makes you think, Mike, that to the people that are listening uh, right now to us or, or watching us, we might ask almost the same question: Who do you say Jesus is? Yeah, because that's a question you have to answer. Yep, good point. And that takes us to verse twenty. The chief priest and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death. And they crucified him. So no first century Jew anticipated, Coach, that God's Messiah would actually be sentenced to death and crucified, especially the way Romans did it. No, because as we've talked about before, crucifixion was the the capital punishment for all major criminals. Right. Uh, it wasn't for everybody, but uh, it was always the threat that the Romans held over the, the people that they could crucify them if they broke the laws or whatever. But uh, especially to be crucified, you had to be really a a bad criminal, you know. And it was very embarrassing because they would strip you naked and hang you on the cross and leave you there for people to see for days. Uh, And uh, so it was was a terrible death to think about, and it was a terrible death to watch. Uh, And uh, obviously it was uh, the worst possible death to, to uh, have to be a part of. And, uh, of course, Jesus was, was in, in all of this totally sinless, totally not guilty, uh, you know, and, uh, but the Romans used that as a tool to terrorize people. Uh, you know, that was their way of keeping their, their thumb on the, on the people. Uh, and and so it was a, a really a bad type of th- situation to even be possible that I could get crucified. And, you know, especially if I wasn't guilty of something, yeah. you know. Uh, so uh, they say that they, the, the chief priests and the rulers handed him over, uh, you know, to, to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. So, as you said, that nobody would anticipate that God who was sending the Messiah would make his own son go through that. And that's the, you know, that's just unimaginable. Uh, and, and again, the, the, con- the problem is they were thinking that he was coming as a conquering king, yep. where instead God sent him simply to, to save them from, the, from sins. And that's why he came. They, and that, that was not even a, something that they could imagine that, he, that God would let his own son go through that. So that's what, again, was in their back of their minds that, you know, where's God? Today, you know, even today when bad things happen to us, you know, people sometimes say, where's God in all this? Yeah. You know, and, and that's kind of where they are, I think. Well, here's another reason why they, they couldn't wrap their mind around why this was happening. You know, everything you just described, I'm sure, was very perplexing mm-hmm. to them. They, they just couldn't figure it out. But here's another piece of this that's very perplexing. And some people at this stage in the narrative tend to walk by this, Coach. And that's the fact, these are Jews we're talking about here. Mm-hmm. These two men that are walking along the road are Jewish people. And their own leaders, the people that they probably looked up to, mm-hmm. are the ones that actually made this crucifixion happen. And that probably, they probably didn't understand it because these, these Jewish leaders, they certainly probably knew who they were. Mm-hmm. And if not, they were probably even celebrities right. to them. Right. So they were probably famous people within that culture. And the fact that they were the ones, that this, 
Messiah came from the Jews, and now the Jewish people were the ones actually executing him. Right, right. It didn't make sense. No, because they 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 were they were used to following what those leaders said right. and taking the the gospel, so to speak. You know, so yeah, that was a I'm sure very difficult for them to understand. All right, verse twenty one. <laughs> but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it's the third day since all this took place. So the, the reason the, the, the travelers were distraught because they had rightly believed that Jesus was the anointed to deliver the Messiah. And it was the third day. Yeah, just by the way. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting how they slipped that in there. You know, uh, yeah, they, they had hoped that Jesus was coming to be the king, the one that was going to free them from the Roman rule, uh, set up the kingdom of God right here on earth and start what had been promised in the prophecies. And and this was what they were waiting for. But with the way, with what happened to Jesus, him being crucified, uh, you know, and, and like we just talked about, you know, surely God would not do that. You know, God would have come to his rescue, you know, rather than let him be right. crucified if he were the Messiah. So this is the reason they don't think now that he was the Messiah. They're losing all their faith in that. And and then uh, uh, he they thought he was coming to redeem Israel. Uh, and as we said, he did come to redeem, but it wasn't the nation. Right. And he has come to redeem people and, uh, and save them from their sins. Then now the next time he comes, it'll be a different story. Yeah. You know, after we've gone through Revelation and everything and looked at what's going to happen, we know the end of the book, so to speak, you know, and, and that's the thing we know next time he comes, he will come as that king and set up his own kingdom here on earth. And then just as a sideline, and, and they, they say, and it, it, by the way, it is the third day. <laughs> so that's like saying, you know, he said he would rise on the third day. And, but where is he? Uh, you know, this is the third day, so it must not be true. Yeah, That's kind of what they're thinking. Well, Jesus is, is, <laughs> is slowly leading them and slowly revealing to them. And he's actually doing it by letting them talk. Right. If you notice, Jesus yeah. asked a question. There's a really good format for us here yeah. whenever we're witnessing to people. Uh -huh. he, he's letting them really explain to him where they are in the world. Even though he already knows, he's helping them realize right. where they are in the world. It, it's, it's really neat. But Jesus needed to teach them that his first coming was all about, you know, he had to die. Mm -hmm. And the reason he had to die was to free them from Satan's curse, from right. Satan's uh, curse of slavery and sin. And then like you said, we'll find in the book of Revelation, and for those of you who, who want to study that, we, we just completed a 17-week study on Revelation, you can find it in our files, uh, that actually talks about the second coming. Exactly. Which fits right into this. Exactly. And, you know, the thing, too, that they didn't, they didn't realize, this very thing that they were questioning and thinking couldn't possibly be allowed will turn out to be the greatest hope of all. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. All right, and that takes us to verse 22 and 23. And it says, in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And the two were part, you know, we, we've seen in, in the other scriptures of all the others. Mm -hmm. So we know these two were in that group, right. so to speak, who had received the report from the women about the empty tomb. Right. And again, as we mentioned earlier, uh, even though they were part of the others, they must not have been really close. And to, and I, I'm I'm guessing they didn't see the angels, uh, you know, which could have made a difference. But these men, they didn't believe the women, you know, which was not unusual what that right. we've talked about before. But they didn't believe the women. They didn't believe the tomb was empty. Uh, they didn't believe that Jesus was risen. And that's why they were so downtrodden as as uh, Jesus walks along with them. So they didn't find the body was the big thing. And well, of course, we know why they didn't find the body, but they were expecting the, you know, to be able to see him one more time. But that's, that's not, not happening, at least now. And uh, 
the fact that they uh, that the women had seen the angels again it goes back to women's credibility right. at that period of time which was not very good uh, and in uh, in many cases they wouldn't even let women testify in court case uh, as a witness <clears throat> you know they they just were not considered that uh, reliable at that time and then uh, said that uh, uh, that Jesus was alive the angels told him and you know it's it's just kind of like what we're trying to do today with people today we're trying to tell them hey guys Jesus is alive today yep. and there's skepticism nobody they don't want to believe it because again it's not something that they can see as normal you know that it's it would have to be a supernatural miracle is the way they look at it and they would just rather not believe it than to face all the facts that we've presented in the last few weeks as to how we know the resurrection did happen. And uh, like we said, uh, a couple of uh, very intelligent uh, people and statesmen have said that there's enough evidence here to prove that Jesus has risen from the grave in a court of law. And without, it wouldn't be hard to prove at all. So, but people, you know, they just believe that skepticism and, and they will not um, let loose and say that it could happen. Well, you look at this too, Coach, and these, these men did not believe the report of the women. Mm -hmm. And quite frankly, I'm not sure it would have mattered who told them these mm -hmm. things. They wouldn't have believed it. Their, their minds just weren't there. Unless, like yeah, you said, possible. they saw the angels for themselves. Right. Uh, they didn't believe the tomb was empty. And there was a lot of unbelief and skepticism around the resurrection at this particular sure. time. And you know, it's like that today. Yeah. Just like you said, certain people feel like they have to research it mm -hmm. and try to prove that it did happen or try to prove that it didn't happen. And we had a, you and I do this live as well on Sunday mornings. And we had a young man who may be 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we were talking about this yeah. same thing. And he raised his hand, and, and you know, we have 60, 65 people, and, and eight or 10 of them are, are kids. Uh -huh. And this young man raised his hand, he said, here's why I believe it. The Bible says it. That's right. So I don't need any <laughs> other reasons. Yeah. I thought that was pretty yeah, good. That's for, for, you know, for a young, youngster that way, that's, that's for sure. It's like, uh, you know, the Bible said it, I believe it, and that settles it. <laughs> All right, let's go to verse 24. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. So the women's report had been confirmed mm -hmm. by the others, more specifically Peter and John. Right. But still Peter and John were skeptical. Very much. <laughs> yeah, because as of this point, they haven't seen Jesus. Right. And that's that, that seems to be the telltale you know, proof that they need, they've got to see him. And uh, like we were talking, poor old Thomas gets all the brunt about being the one that doesn't believe when really it's all of them for, for right now are, are still not, they don't know what's going on, but the, they certainly are not believing that Jesus has yeah. risen yet. So uh, Jesus' followers had to, to understand and live in faith if they really thought he was risen, just like we do, you know. Uh, it has to come through faith and trust the promises of, of Jesus. But it's certainly beginning to seem as if Jesus has kept his promise, that he has literally risen, you know, after they look in and saw the grave clothes and, and the, the, the tomb is not there. They know the Romans were guarding the tomb. It was sealed with a big stone. And, uh, you know, they, they are starting to realize, hey, the, uh, where's the body? You know, as we talked about last week, you know, we know the Romans didn't steal the body right. or they would have presented it. Uh, the guards wouldn't have let anybody steal it because it cost them their lives if they did. And the disciples, if, if, if they stole it, they would never suddenly turn from being cowards to being the bravest of all, knowing they are putting their lives on their line, trying to say, you know, trying to tell everybody they believe the lie, you know, if they had the body. So it doesn't make sense. The only thing that does make sense is Jesus did just what he said he'd do. Yeah, and I, I've often wondered, Coach, if, if men like you and I or, or whoever would switch places with these disciples back at that time mm -hmm. and had gone through everything they went through that, 
got the opportunity to walk, talk, eat, and, and sleep with Jesus, and, and then to watch what they had to watch, mm-hmm. uh, and even look at Peter, who had denied him three right. times in, in that one night. Uh, all of that agony that they went through in, in this last little bit of period here that we're, we're discussing, I'm not, I think all of us would have reacted the same way. Oh, I do too. It would have been the same way. Uh, you know, the skepticism would have come right in just, just like it's happening here. And, and, but Jesus goes on a little bit later in, in another piece of Scripture and says, blessed are those who believe without seeing. Right, yeah. And, and that's the where we camp out today. Right. That's our world. And, and I really feel like if these disciples were living in our era, mm-hmm. that they had the Bible and they had all these witnesses that we were able to read about in the Bible, I believe they would be just like, the rest of us today who are Christians, yeah. they would believe without seeing. Right, exactly. So we shouldn't beat up on them too bad, no, I guess no. is what I'm saying. No. And that takes us to the, the second part of our narrative here today in, in verses 25 through 27 and 30 and 31, <clears throat> Coach, are going to talk about Jesus actually revealing himself. Right. And this even gets more exciting. And here we see verse 25. He said to them, How foolish you are and how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. So at this point, Jesus gave Cleopas and the other disciple a pretty sharp rebuke. Yeah. Yeah. And and I I don't know, but, you know, these, I'm sure, had been following him a long time. And, uh, you know, he knew knew who they were. Right. And and, uh, so... His rebuke, first of all, he calls them foolish, and that's one of the, like a slap in the face just about to a Jew. To a Jew, yeah. Yeah, and you're foolish, and and then how slow you are to believe. And this, of course, is referencing to Scripture and prophecy from the Old Testament right. that, had, that had prophesied Christ's coming and prophesied of his death. Uh, I, you know, the, uh, the part of uh, Isaiah 53 talks about the suffering servant and describes what the servants, the, ser- the uh, uh, Messiah is going to have to go through. So they don't, you know, they don't know that scripture, or they, at least they don't want to know that scripture or believe it. And he's telling them, if you would have known the scripture, if you'd have paid attention to what the scripture was, if you had listened to what I said in my preaching, I told you several times, this was going to happen. Yep. You know, and that I would rise again the third day. So he's scolding him for the fact of not necessarily a lack of faith, but a lack of knowledge here. And and that that you know just just lets me know uh, that uh, we need to know what the scriptures say. And that's why you and I do what we do, and that's why it's so important for people to read the Bible. To, to get into a, a study group or, or a class like our Sunday school or whatever. And, and uh, like we say, this is online on Sunday mornings and you're welcome to, to join wherever you live. And, but you are responsible. The Bible tells us that when you meet Jesus and we have to give account of your life, uh, you know, then there, there, he says there is no excuse. Right. You have the opportunity. And part of it is right here in these scriptures. And, and that's the thing, you know, too. We can look back on all those things that, that happened and look back at them through history. And, and we get a chance to go or to, to, to maybe make a decision. Do we think it really happened that way or not? And uh, like, like our, our little friend said, uh, said in uh, Sunday school the other day, you know, I believe it because it's in the Bible. The Bible says so. <laughs> and that's what we have to do. And that's the part we take by faith. Yeah, you know, because it and it can't be proven totally, but that's where faith comes in. The, these two men, along with a lot of others, but mm-hmm. these two men specifically, because that's who Jesus is talking to, were slow to comprehend and understand, right. and then very slow to act. Right. Well, he's implying here spiritual dullness. Yeah. And, and basically, what he's saying is, you have the same spiritual dullness that the Sadducees, who really knew the scriptures and uh-huh. the power of God, had as well. Right. And he's really rebuking them. And yes, he is. Sometimes I wonder, Coach, if we don't need that same rebuke yeah. at times. Well, you know, and like I said, I don't know how people are going to stand in front of Christ and, and say, but, but I didn't know that. You know, that's what they're, they're, they're going to say. I, I didn't realize that. 
And, and he, you know, he is, the sad part is he says, you have no excuse. Right. You have no excuse because it's there. It's in the Bible. It's, 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 it's uh, you know, proven uh, without a shadow of a doubt if, throughout the Bible. If you take the Bible as, as a whole and study it from the beginning to the end, and you'll see Jesus this little thread weaves all the way through the Bible. Yes, it does. The Old Testament to New Testament. It's all about so, him. It, that's what the, this book is about. Yep. That takes us to verse 26. And it says, Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And he's asking them a very simple question here, Coach. But what he's doing is he's really revealing God's entire plan to them. Mm-hmm. Right. As, uh, as I said, he's saying, Don't you remember, didn't the scriptures that you studied, didn't they tell you that the Messiah had to suffer and he had to die? And, and like I made mention of Isaiah 53, which is a set of verses that we that we refer to the suffering servant, mm-hmm. which is the Messiah. And these are things things are all laid out. You you start in Genesis is where it begins. It talks about Genesis in chapter in uh, Genesis 3:15, which ta- which begins the whole thing with the against evil and the and the and Satan in the Garden of Eden. And that reference all the way through all the Old Testament prophets, and 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 that's what Jesus is is starting to do here. He's taking these guys back clear to the beginning and say, "Don't you remember right here? This is what Scripture says. You know that, the, and it says that the Messiah has to suffer yep. before he comes into his glory. It says that he's the suffering servant, right? And what." What they where they are camped out is they feel like that because he suffered and he died that he wasn't the Messiah. Right. When actually right. what it did is it proved it he proved was the Messiah. Was. Exactly. exactly. And, and that just hasn't resonated uh-huh. with them. But it's going to here in yeah. a second. Right. But Jesus said when he had suffered these things he should enter into his glory, which he did at his resurrection. That, that's right. the second thing right. we have there. And that takes us to verse twenty seven. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus referred to the Hebrew scriptures, Coach, what we as Christians today call the Old Testament. Right, right. And, and, and the thing that we know is, uh, as you said, the Old Testament simply, if you follow through it, you've, you can see Jesus all the way through it if you look for him. And in many, many scriptures and uh, the, the books, and that's, uh, that's what uh, uh, Jesus is doing with them. He's taking them clear back to the beginning and saying, we, you know, these scriptures said this. The next scripture says this. And he takes them right through the Old Testament to where he is right now. And that's why he's saying to him, you don't know the scriptures. Yet, you know, you, you're slow uh, to, to learn the scriptures. Well, you know, there's a lot of people today that are more than slow learning the scriptures. They just flat don't want to learn the scriptures because yeah. they don't like what they have to say because they don't really understand them. And, and that's why th- that we do what we do here uh, to try to maybe let some people understand, maybe give them some, some help in understanding, you know, that, that there's, there's no question about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That, that is not a, a, you know, an if statement. That is a fact. Yep. And we can prove that through the scripture. And uh, now, you know, you got a lot of naysayers and a lot of people that are saying that, no, you can't. It's, you know, it's impossible for that to happen. And, uh, you know, and, and we can argue about it, but at least we have the Bible to back up what we believe. And, uh, and that's the thing that uh, a lot of people don't realize that how much, if you just stop and think about it and really study, you'll come to realize that this could not all just have happened, right. you know. And and all these things do point to the very thing we're studying right now, and that's the resurrection of Christ. Now, bear in mind, Coach, they're still walking on the road to Emmaus, right? Right. And a normal walking pace would be about two miles an hour. But I think when Jesus rebuked them. You would have to think that they stopped dead in their tracks and turned, and the walking stopped. Yeah, could have. I, yeah. I, I'm just speculating here. Yeah, I, I don't think I would continue listening. Yeah. But then bear in mind, they still don't know who the no. stranger no. is. And that takes us to our second question. And that is, how should we respond to someone who says the Old Testament is not valuable? Now, we kind of already answered that a little bit. Yeah, yeah. 
Uh, I heard a saying a long time ago that kind of answers that question. Uh, and the saying goes like this. It's, it says, in the, old, uh, in the Old Testament contained is the New Testament explained. Right. And that's, that's a, a statement that always stayed with me. Uh, basically, and it's, what it means is that you don't understand the New Testament without understanding what the Old Testament says. And, and, this, and we are getting to the point where that if the Jewish leaders had really known and understood the Old Testament prophecies, which was all they had anyway, uh, you know, they would have known who Jesus was and would have recognized him as a Messiah. They wouldn't have crucified him, you know, and, and they would have known that. And then we have people today that are following that concept right now saying, ah, you don't need to study the Old Testament, just read the New Testament, that's all you need to know and how to get saved. And folks, that, that is not true. That's terrible. Uh, that, you know, that is a, a false teaching. And, uh, uh, you know, we just, you have to go back there. They're, they're saying that because the Old Testament is so unbelievable, there's so many things that just don't, that no, they don't think, people don't think can happen. They don't believe that part of it. And that keeps them from believing the new part. That's their uh, reasoning behind saying you don't need the Old Testament. But my, my answer is simply, it, you know, it's the Old Testament you need because so you can see just how great God is yep. and what he is capable of doing. That's where all the, the great stories we get about, you know, Samson and, and the things he did and David and, and you read the, the stories that you start out in, in uh, you know, nursery school here at the church and learn about. Uh, but then you start, as an adult, you start looking at those same stories and you realize, hey, that has a lot of application to me today. And, uh, you know, and, and it gives us the beginning of sin. It gives us the Ten Commandments. Uh, it gives us the foundation for the law. Uh, it gives us foundation of how we are to live. The two greatest institutions that come about from the Old Testament are uh, the, uh, the idea of, of marriage and, a fa- and the other one is family. You know, and you look at what's going on in our country right now, look at what's being, what's letting us down yep. in the family. And it's no wonder that our kids are confused and our kids are, are don't know what to do about what they're hearing. Uh, and if we, you can't have freedom, true freedom without morality. And it has to be God's morality. Uh, you know, he's the one that made the mor- morality, uh, the moral code that, that we, our country was built on. And you can't have freedom without having a moral code. Yep. Otherwise, people can just go do what they think they want to do. And that's where we're getting today if we don't get it stopped pretty soon. Yeah, you look at the entire Bible, Coach, from mm-hmm. Genesis to Revelation. All of it is God's Word. Right. And it, it's perfect. Mm-hmm. And, and really where you realize how that comes to fruition is in the book of Revelation. Mm-hmm. Because as we went through our Revelation study, we went referred back to all the Old Testament right. scriptures, especially Genesis, mm-hmm. and it all threads together. But if God's word is important, it, it's his holy word, it's his uh, playbook for life, basically for all of us, he dedicated 75% of that book to the Old Testament. Mm-hmm. So it must be important. Right. So we should be studying it. The Old Testament substantially influences our understanding of key biblical teachings Mm -hmm. like you were talking about that are even in the new testament right those don't come to life if you don't apply the old testament foundations right that are there we meet the same god in both testaments Mm -hmm. that's what a lot of people don't realize it's the same good news of jesus christ jesus it's his book right It, it talks about jesus from beginning to end the whole thing and Failing to declare the whole counsel of God can put us in danger before the Lord. Sure. Uh, That's a know, scary thought. Yeah, you know, you, you just you don't realize how much of the beginning that you have to, to know to understand what's going on in the New Testament. Yeah. And that's where, you know, some of these preachers I was talking about, that's what they were, don't understand. They've got it backwards. We're not confused because of what the Old Testament said. We're confused because we don't know what it says. Yeah. And, and uh, that's the thing that, that people need to realize. 
And that's why uh, the whole Bible, you got you to look at it all. You can't take it apart because you can't, it doesn't, one book doesn't stand alone. Yep, yep. All right, let's go to verse 30. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And Jesus himself became the host here, Coach. And he took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And where have we heard that before? Yeah, it sounds a little bit like the <laughs> communion, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. And that's, that's the thing. Uh, there was something very special about, about Jesus breaking the bread and giving it to the, you know, it takes you back to the feeding of the 5,000 and, and uh, uh, you know, how he was able to do that miracle. And then, of course, at the Last Supper in the upper room there and uh, uh, where he gave, broke the bread for the, for the disciples and each gave, the, gave them the bread. And so he is, uh, you know, the Bible tells us he's the bread of life. Yep. And it's interesting what happens here now that he has broken this bread for these these two guys, that as as we uh, we shall see, uh, and he says it says he took the bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and began to give it to them. And and let's go ahead and go to thirty one. So okay. let me just finish it out here, and we'll come back to that. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. All right. So here you go. As soon as he broke the bread. It was like their eyes were broken open, yeah, you know, and and we see here that that uh, Jesus they recognized this not because they had been at the Last Supper, but simply because I'm sure that he they had seen him do it many times. Yeah, it's not you know he he did communion many times I'm sure with the disciples and his followers, so that just opened their eyes totally. Uh, because Jesus, when Jesus broke the bread, like I said, he is the bread, called the bread of life. And I, something clicked right then, those spiritual eyes, God let them open, and they saw the whole thing uh, all of a sudden. So, uh, uh, you know, it, it's, a, it's nice that they, they got to see him, but he didn't let them stay very long. He, he wanted them to get out and spread the word, because now they know he's alive. Well, think about this too, Coach. This is a classic example of teaching that Jesus mm -hmm. uses here because he did not reveal to them up front who he was. Right. He did not allow himself to be revealed to until he was ready right. for them. They, until they, they were ready. Until they were ready right. to do exactly what he was wanting because right. the, these guys have got to run back now and, and be a witness. Again, right. here's these two witnesses established just like in the Old Testament. But it's the intimacy of fellowship where Jesus is recognized. Right. And fellowship, especially over a meal, was really important to Jesus. He did a lot of his teaching right. over food right. and around food and around the meal. The setting was no mistake. It was according to God's plan. And, and many of the resurrection appearances are associated with table fellowship, right. which we see here. Right. And that takes us to... That last question, and maybe we unpacked this a little bit already, Coach, and that how can a fellowship meal be an opportunity to share the gospel? Well, you know, when I see fellowship meal, obviously the first one I think of is communion. Right. That's fellowship meal, you know. Uh, and we know how holy that is, That you know, how that, you know, I, I still get goosebumps when we do com the communion and about the uh, uh, the passing the bread and passing the the uh, the, the wine or the or the juice, and uh, it, because you have a chance, if it's done the way that Jesus set it up, you have a chance to really talk to Him before you take the the, the bread and before you take the cup. You have a chance to clear your uh, your mind of, of sin and ask forgiveness, and then you have a time to, of. Uh, the fellowship where you're, you are uh, uh, really excited about what's going on here. And, and like I said, every time we have it, I still get goosebumps because I know what it means. And that's, that's the thing, that, that, that's the ultimate fellowship meal. And that's the kind of fellowship meal we'll have when we get to heaven. Being, being a Baptist church coach, we're all about fellowship meals. I yeah, mean, we, I, we definitely like, like our, our, our meals, but... One thing Jesus did is he met the physical needs of people before he ministered to them. Right. And the hungry should be fed. Right. And that's something he always did. The other thing he did is, if you remember, he gave thanks. Yeah. And what that's telling us is food is a gift from God, and he's verifying that. 
eating meals together connects people in ways that they can't get connected right. otherwise. Uh, eating is also an act of stewardship mm-hmm. that, that you are able to, to plan and to have and to be able to have food to cook. There's real power in sharing a meal, and right. Jesus proves that over and over again right. throughout his teachings. And that takes us to our thought to remember, and it is this. Live as if Christ died yesterday, arose this morning, and is coming back tomorrow. Tomorrow may be the day. And Coach, could you take that powerful thought to remember? Give us some final thoughts as we wrap it up here. Yeah, I don't know how I can add a whole lot to that. That's (laughs) that's about the way you should live. And uh, we do know, for example, that, you know, as we said, the resurrection is the most important event in all history. And that's what we're getting ready to celebrate on on Easter Sunday. Uh, And it's the the thing that you have to believe in order to become saved. You know, we've said before, it's not enough to believe that that there is a God. It's not enough to believe that he had a son named Jesus. It's not enough to believe that uh, he, he, you know, he did miracles and things. He was not just a great prophet. You know, you have to believe that he did exactly what we talked about in our lesson today. He died, he was buried, he rose again the third day to be alive forevermore. Yeah. And you have to believe that resurrection part of it uh, in order to, to meet the criteria of becoming saved. And, that, and that's, that's the thing that makes it so different. You know, these, these other guys, people we're talking about, they got to see him, they got to hear him and so forth. You know, but it wasn't until they believed in his resurrection that they really became Christians. Yep. And, and that's where, what we have to understand, that, that we have to believe that. So, uh, you know, that, that's what, what we're, uh, you know, the whole thing is about. As you said, it's about Jesus Christ. And the ultimate is that he's resurrected and he's defeated death, hell, and the grave. And, and that's what we have to put our hopes on. Because if he can do it for himself, he can certainly do it for us. Yeah. And uh, you know, I, I like like the, the the thoughts of that. The way you know, that's the way I want my life to end up. And I heard a little story the other day about about that. A little boy was had a birthday, and his daddy said, "You can go down to the pet store and pick out a puppy for you." So they went down to the pet store to pick out the puppy, and uh, the boy saw the one little puppy in there. Boy, his tail was just. Well, you know, just going 90 mile an hour. And then he said, Daddy, that's the one I want. And so his dad says, well, why did you pick that one? He said, because I wanted one with happy, with a happy ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's what our story is. This is a happy ending at Easter right here. It, it really is, Coach. And we, we began this segment with, you know, talking about Jesus' followers did not recognize him immediately following his resurrection. And how is that possible? And how is it possible that many do not recognize Jesus for who he is today or recognize the presence of Jesus? And hopefully, you know, we've been able to clearly give you a look at that here, here in this segment. And if you have any questions about that, we'd be glad to walk you through it. If you'd like to accept Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, like many of the people that we are studying here did, we would love to have a conversation with you. Again, this is Pine Grove Baptist Church in Parkersburg, West Virginia, and you should see the contact information on the screen. And if you have any questions about anything, please feel free to reach out to us here at the church. For those of you who watch week to week, or maybe this is your very first time, we would encourage you to share this message with your friends or your contacts out on whatever social media platform it is that you subscribe to. It just gets the word out. We're also out on podcast platform, and we would encourage you to share that as well. We thank each one of you for making us part of your day. We don't take it for granted, and we do see it as a very, very dear privilege. Next week, the title of our study is Jesus Cooks Breakfast. More food, Coach. Still say he's a Baptist. (laughs) (laughs) And we're going to be in the book of John, and we're real excited about that. And so until next time, this is Mike Cornell along with Coach Ron Lathy and our production manager, Andy Holbrook, wishing everybody have a blessed week, and we hope to see you real soon. 